Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Discamu session. It is a privilege and a pleasure to have you here. My name is Neil Lacan. I am the Jeffrey Rockwell Cudlip Memorial Jefferson Scholar at the University of Virginia. I study English, concentrating in medieval and Renaissance literature, and most of my studies focus particularly on Renaissance drama. And so we're here today to talk about Roman drama, something that intersects with that in a lot of ways, and is, as I hope, you know, you'll see over the course of this session, profoundly fascinating. Um, thank you once again for being here and being interested in talking about these topics. How gender and how class are portrayed in Roman drama is something that is profoundly significant for the storytelling that you're exposed to and that I'm exposed to today. And that is the sort of thing we're trying to parse out through this session. So thank you so much once again no greater compliment can be given to a student, researcher, academic, whatever, than caring about their material and engaging with it. So I thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen now. Um, I will pull up my presentation here and we'll get going. Pardon that. All right, perfect. So the fancy title of our presentation is A Culture in Constancy, Gender and Gentility from Roman Drama to American Cinema. We're going to be looking at everything from the very foundations of Roman comedy. We're going to be spending a lot of time with Plautus today, all the way to, to all the boys I've loved before um, in the end of the presentation. And we're seeing how this tradition develops. So how Plautus begins this tradition in the 220s and 210s BCE, and then how that continues and morphs into particularly the romance, gender, class storytelling tradition that we have in romantic comedy and comedy today. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with an overview of the Roman theater. Before we do that, I do wanna give everyone this quick content warning. We are gonna be talking about some non-explicit sexual themes and storylines in the plays we go over today. So we'll be talking through three of Plautus's plays in addition to a Shakespeare play and then two films. So over the course of all of that, I know that's a lot. We're gonna be doing some brief overviews. Um, we won't delve too much into it. I promise guys, I'll say this from the top of the show today. Um, I could spend a whole class, multiple years, going over each section of this presentation. What I'm trying to do for you today is give you a brief grounding in the traditions that we as students of literature and students of cinema are engaging with every day and trying to um, apply to our modern discourse while understanding how the past informs us. And so we will be dealing with a couple of these stories do have some non-explicit sexual themes, some storylines which involve sexual um, content, like I said, not explicit in any way. Um, this presentation is, is perfectly high school and, um, and high school safe and everything. So don't worry about that. But I wanted to give this warning in advance as I know we're looking at these asynchronously. So let's go ahead and move forward to a brief discussion of the Roman theater. This is a picture of a Roman theater in, I believe, the city of Merida in Spain. And this is obviously ruins, but a pretty good sample of what the Roman stage is going to look like. We don't get a lot of the audience, but we have sort of a 180 amphitheater, uh, much like the Greek tradition. The difference between the Greek theater and the Roman theater, you guys have probably already gone over this, particularly if you're advanced students, um, is this set, the Skyna, um, the set that is going to sprout off of the stage. Um, we have three different houses here, as you can see, columns. We have Corinthian column fronts, two stories, and there are going to be three doors. So there'll be one, um, you can see some of the doorways here. I don't know if you guys can see my cursor very well, but I don't have annotations on, I apologize. But this doorway, if you can see that right in the center here, um, and then this one over here. So we have three houses, a street. That's the basic vocabulary with which the Roman theater is going to work. Basically every play that's going to be staged, particularly during the period of Roman drama that we study the most, that's Plautus and Terence in the third century, early second century BCE, it's going to be working with this vocabulary. Three houses, street, um, this sort of domestic setting, which is really important for us because this comedy that we're going to take a look at is so domestic in nature. It's so um, mundane, not in the sense of um, the way that the word mundane is in English, but the etymological sense, which you all should know from being Latin students of Mundus, the world, the, it, it is a, um, an everyday story. This is a place where everyday stories are told. And that is what we're going to see with 
clouting comedy. Um, and with Terentian comedy, we're not going to be spending time on Terence today, but I, I strongly encourage you to check him out as well. Um, this here is the University of Virginia, where I go to school. And it is the amphitheater at UVA. As you can see, very similar concept. Three doors um, here. Again, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but we have three doors right in the center here with the street. Now, of course, we have the, the sides project out here, so we don't get quite the same stage. But then we have the 180 degree um, seating area. And then something that wouldn't have been in the Roman theater, of course, is the large green um, where very famously uh, around the time of exam, sometimes you have to see small animals, very cute small animals come out there to help us de-stress. Um, not to turn this into a UVA ad, but you know, um, no commissions uh, being being received on this presentation, but but a nice a nice thing to do for um, for my university, I suppose. And also a very good example of the Roman theater in the Virginia landscape. Um, it's definitely there and still a present part of the landscape today. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Plautine comedy before we jump into plays themselves. All right, so I wanna start with um, just a brief overview, right? Most of Plautus's comedy, um, this guy, by the way, Titus Machius Plautus, I didn't include a biography slide because we're mostly looking at the content and the themes and honestly, we just don't have time. I'm trying to get through a lot of content here, but he is a playwright in the third century BCE in Rome. Uh, the time of the Punic War actually, or the second Punic War is when he is doing most of his writing. Um, his plays are sourced and or copied almost directly from Greek new comedy, specifically for the students of Greek out there. First of all, God bless you. Greek is a very difficult task. Um, but for the students of Greek out there, these are the comedies of Menander that he is sourcing and copying sometimes his plays from. We have the classical standard of Roman comedy is the stock characters. Um, these are characters that basically appear the same. Plautus has 20 extant plays, um, which we have, you know, that extant meaning they survive, um, 20 of them. And basically all of them follow this pattern of some mixes of stock characters, stock plots as well. Most of these, though not all of them, focus on romantic impropriety. So that's a uh, rich guy, poor girl, or seemingly poor girl. We'll get more into that in a moment. Um, mistaken identity is a classic. We're going to look at Menaikmi, which is a classic example of that. And then other just social dynamics. Like I said, these are social plays. They're everyday plays. We're taking it, we're, these, these circumstances are taking place in a very everyday Roman setting, despite the fact that many of the names are still Greek because Plotus did not bother to change the names from Menander. Um, even so, we have these everyday Roman situations. They're often highly driven, as I say here, by romantic and erotic desire, and they are rather explicit. I have basically sort of uh, censored the edges of Plautine comedy today for everyone's benefit, but it is profoundly sexual um, and very explicit in, in its sexual nature. There's a lot of very lewd jokes, um, you know, and most of that's also misogynistic. We're gonna talk a little bit about that as well, but just to, to get everyone up to speed there on that. Um, a quick overview of Roman comedy and gender more broadly before we move into examples. So as I said, we're talking about stock characters here, right? One of those stock characters is the Weirgo, um, which yes, uh, is related to the word virgin. And in this case, probably a virgin as well on stage, the Weirgo. Um, the young marriageable age woman, that's the Weirgo. She's typically, um, you know, sometimes she's an enslaved woman actually. She's not always, um, in fact, as we said earlier, the poor woman uh, who's seemingly poor, but then is later discovered to be rich, very common trope in Roman comedy. Um, and we see that a lot with the Weirgo. Um, the meretrix is the other side of that. And this contrast really forms a lot of the gendering in Roman comedy. So the Weirgo, the young, marriageable aged woman, um, if poor, then still rather upstanding, decorous woman. Um, and then the meretrix was typically older, though not always a promiscuous woman. I put that in quotes because that's often, you know, promiscuity is a word that gets thrown around a lot in a misogynistic context. Um, and I think that's, I mean, that's the case here, certainly, which is why I put it in quotes. But she's an older, whatever, more promiscuous, uh, more sexually active woman or a prostitute, a sex worker of some kind. Um, the side of that on, um, from the male perspective is the conflict between the Adulescens, um, who is a young man, typically of high status, 
and the Senex or the Pater Familias, right? That's um, his father typically, though it can also be some other male authority figure. Um, and he is, to paraphrase uh, Catullus V, he talks about the Senum Sewerorum in that, in that poem. Uh, he is a Senex Sewerus. He's a stern old man, a severe old man, um, and often is trying to prevent the Adelaiskens from doing what he wants to do, which is party and, um, you know, get with as many women as possible and all, and all of those things. And so um, we're going to see that in Mustelaria in a moment, but just keep that in mind. And then women in Plautus, I apologize in advance. It's really disgusting um, how, how he portrays women. Objects at best of desire. Um, that's, there's a slight typo on the slide, I apologize. Objects at best of desire um, and at worst of outright purchase. Um, and we're gonna see a woman who is auctioned off literally in a play in a moment. Plautus does not really you know, spend any time with female perspectives, um, with women's stories. And women on stage are, as it says here, you know, mostly objects of desire to move the plot forward. They are thoroughly, and I use objects for an obvious purpose, right? They are objectified um, in, in the most clear and evident sense. And so that's really important to understand um, when approaching Plautian comedy. Um, moving forward into class, as I said, the wealthy young man, the misclassed young woman, um, and then they're fighting against social standards. We sort of talked about that. I want to point out as well, slavery is an essential ingredient in, and I, I put it with emphasis here, genuinely all Roman drama has enslaved people, right? It is so present. This not only means, right, that we're dealing with upper class characters, which we are because they have slaves, um, but also, right, that these enslaved people are the center of so many stories in their own right, if not the center, like subplots tend to focus on particularly male slaves, male enslaved people um, are the center of so many of these subplots. We're gonna see that again in a moment. But slavery is so foundational to Roman society. It cannot be understated how central it is to Rome's drama as well. And I think that is so important to understand. Um, so let's make sure we're keeping that in mind and being mindful of the sort of dehumanization um, that is inherent in the Roman dramatic experience and in Roman society, particularly in this class level. And then finally, just a quick note, the actors themselves, often of ridiculously low social standing, I'm sure uh, through your studies in Latin as um, middle and high school students, whatever, wherever you are on that journey, you have likely heard of the low social standing of actors in Roman society. Um, this tends to be the case right up until uh, the advent of cinema, um, though there are occasional examples uh, of vaudeville um, being this way. I don't want to get on a tangent um, into that, but low social standing, very much the case in Plautus's day. These actors are not upper-class people, but they're portraying, in some cases, upper-class people. And that's important to just understand. That's something we talk about a lot in Shakespeare studies as well, with the sense of, you know, all of these parts, even the women's parts, are being played by, by men, because on the Renaissance English stage, you have a homosocial space, right, which is, is male only. Um, and that's sort of a thing we talk about a lot with Shakespeare. And I think Plautus sort of has a similar thing with class, right? Like, these are all low-class people playing in some cases, some of them are playing enslaved people, others are playing upper class authoritative figures. And that is really interesting as well. All right, so let's get on to some examples. We've talked a lot about theory. I wanna move into now some really concrete places where we can see this tradition at work in Plautus. Um, the adjective for Plautus is Plautine, by the way, I've said that a couple of times, but just um, to note. So Plautine examples of this, we're gonna look at three plays. Um, we're gonna look at Menaikmi, Mostelaria and Cassina. These are gonna be our three plays for Plautus. Then we're gonna move on to some of his descendants and how the tradition continues. Um, so let's get into it. We have first up Menaikmi, a brief plot summary here on the slide. I'm not gonna read all of this. I'm just gonna sort of talk you through the play at its broadest level. I should say for all of these cases, my summaries are going to be woefully inaccurate. Um, if there are fans of Roman drama out there who are like, but you missed this element of Menaikmi, or oh my God, how could you forget this part of Mostelaria? Um, calm down. <laughs> we'll talk more about it potentially in the Q&A. We can talk more about it in the discussion. But for our purposes, we're trying to look at some very specific things. So I'm drawing out plot that is really going to illustrate gender and, and class, or as I put it in the title, right, gender and gentility um, 
in Roman drama. Um, so let's go ahead and get into Menaikmi. So we have two twins. They were separated at birth. They're reunited in the beginning of the play in the same city of Epidamnus. Um, and their identities get mistaken repeatedly. Um, so you have one, uh, one of the twins, right, is you know, he's a resident of Epidamnus and the other one has come to look for his lost brother and they're constantly getting mistaken for each other. Um, so the, I've, I've termed the one who lives there the resident brother, um, which I understand is a very legalistic way of, of saying it. But so the, the brother who lives in Epidamnus, the resident brother's uh, wife, he's, she's enraged at his affair um, with a um, Ameritrix, right? A prostitute, um, Erotium. Lots to say about the name Erotium. Uh, those fast Latin minds out there will know that this name basically means sexy um, or um, like attractive. I, I don't know, that's, that's basically what the name means. And I mean, we'll get into names in a second. We'll wait, wait for the next slide. But um, ultimately what happens, there's a lot that goes on, lots of farcical hijinks that they get up to. Um, Erotium mistakes the other brother for her lover, and you know there's there's a whole conflict there. And then the wife mistakes um, the non-resident brother for the resident brother. It's just there's so much that goes on. But ultimately, the two brothers discover each other's identities. They're reunited. They return to Syracuse, where they were born. Um, after the one who lives there auctions off everything in his house, including his wife, who was auctioned off. Um, or at least offered up for auction as a good, as an item. Um, obviously lots to say there. So let's get into some gender topics here. We got a classic case here of the Weirgo Meritrix, or in this case, the Uxor Meritrix, the wife versus the prostitute. Um, and we see that here in the conflict between the wife, who literally does not have a name, by the way. Um, she's unnamed entirely. You see this, if, if any of you are somehow fascinated by this uh, presentation and want to go study drama uh, in an academic context, you will see this so often. There are so many cases in which women are unnamed in plays. It's ridiculously common. Um, all the way up to a musical called The Seven Year Itch, which certainly your uh, grandparents will have heard of. Um, it was also a, a film in 1955 um, where Marilyn Monroe famously is in this film and her character is called The Girl. Like that, that's, that's all. And it's, a, it's actually a film that, that sort of maps onto uh, plotting comedy very well because you have um, the wife versus the, the paramour, the mistress, the lover, whatever, um, the same sort of adultery plot going on. Um, so anyway, we have that conflict and that is obviously, you know, wrapped up in these questions of female chastity and like we look down or like Plautus is telling us to look down at Erotium because she's a sex worker. I mean, my God, right? The virtuous woman does not engage in this according to these Plautian rules. Obviously this is ridiculously misogynistic um, because of the classic um, dichotomy between men who get to have basically all the sexual activity they want, whereas women um, basically, you know, you have to say chaste um, in all cases, right? Regardless of just outside of marriage, um, which is the only time. So we have that sort of hypocrisy going on here and the classic conflict, as I said, between the weirgo and the meritrix. Then our weirgo or our uxor though, does not get off easy um, just because she's the quote unquote virtuous woman or the dacorous woman in this case. Instead, she is auctioned off, as I said, um, along with household items. And there's a lot to be said there, right? The wife is unnamed. She doesn't even get an identity beyond being the wife of this brother, this twin brother, right? She's auctioned off to begin with. Obviously objectification, obviously, you know, a huge amount of demeaning, um, demeaning context there, right? And then the third thing, she's auctioned off with household items, really driving in the sense that the woman is the house, right? Like the house and the woman are connected. Um, it dehumanizes her, it reinforces gender roles, it's disgusting. Um, and it's important to talk about, right? This is part of the foundation of Western com comedic and romantic storytelling. It starts here and just wait, right? If you think that this is the only time, I talked about The Seven Year Rich already. Um, I can go through a list of musicals and films for you right now. This stays 
with us. It is here, it is part of our tradition and it's important to talk about. The other point, the last point here, really important, homosocial men's relations get valued as more valuable. They're prized over heterosocial relations or homosocial women's relations, which are basically not talked about at all. Brief definition for homosociality, for those of you who have not encountered the word before, homosocial meaning uh, the same gender uh, in a space, right? So a homosocial space, I talked about the Renaissance English stage as a homosocial space. That is because there's only men uh, in the acting companies, right? So a homosocial men's space or homosocial men's relationship is going to be the relationship with the brothers, right? That is a relationship between men that is not romantic, right? So that is obviously not social. Um, that is romantic or sexual, and therefore it does not fall under the term homosocial. Homosocial is family and friends um, that are, in this case, homosocial male relations. Those are the most important, right? As soon as his brother is found, you know, they go together because the brother means more than, maybe he's been married to his wife for we don't even know how many years, and she's just cast aside entirely because the homosocial male bonds are more valuable than the heterosocial bonds, the bonds between men and women, or in that case, it would actually be a heteroromantic um, bond, but you know what I'm saying, right? And then homosocial women's bonds, relationships between women, um, friendships between women, nowhere to be found <laughs> in monogamy. Um, lots more to say here. I mean, there's so much to talk about. Brief stuff about class here, four enslaved people in the play, all of them are playing integral roles. Um, the enslaved people, and this is characteristic of Plautus, are way more clever and smart than their upper class um, counterparts in the play, the main characters. Um, the, the, the enslaved people are the ones who have to explain to the two brothers that they're in fact identical twins, despite the fact that they're looking at each other and they don't know they're identical, right? This sort of satire of upper class kind of stupidity or like a spoiledness that makes them, you know, we've all seen this stereotype before, that's really present in Menaikmi. We also talked about Erotium, right? Erotium's lower status as a prostitute, as the Meritrix, the contrast between her um, and the Uxor, in this case, the virtuous woman, um, her being promiscuous. Again, something that only gets pushed upon women. We don't see that, of course, with men in this play or in the Roman dramatic tradition. Moving on to Mostelaria. Um, so Philolaches is our main character here. Young guy, partied, drinking, enjoying himself while his father is away. His father comes back. This is a problem. So an enslaved man, Tranio, right? He is the one who basically stands at the door of Philolaches um, or Philolaches' dad's house while he's like having a party inside. I, You know, there's been productions of this where there's like a whole like, you know, party going on inside the house. And then outside, Tranio is talking to the dad and is basically like, listen, this house is haunted. You cannot come in. And it works, right? He's able to deceive Philolaches' father. Um, he's able to like evade all of these, but wait, if it were haunted this, or like the holes that start getting poked in his story. Another point that happens in this play, Philolaches borrows some money to buy the freedom of an enslaved woman he loves. Um, his debt eventually ends up getting covered by a friend at the end of the play. At the end of the play, by the way, also the father forgives him. It, it all works out because this is comedy, it ends well. Um, but that's Mostelaria, the haunted house. Um, really great play. I wish we could spend more time on it. I mean, all of these plays deserve whole lectures in and of themselves. Um, and I really actually, before doing this, this, um, this discomus, I, I debated whether I wanted to take a really long look at one play. Um, but I decided I wanted to give you like a more broad introduction to the discourse so we have more to talk about. Um, nevertheless, forging ahead, gender and class here. What do we get? We get a heavily male-centered story again, but even more so, right? Philomatium, um, who is the enslaved woman who is then freed by Philolaches with the purchase um, of her freedom, is the only major female character. And she's one of only two female characters in the whole piece, right? Which is crazy. Um, out of 10 total characters, right? We see once again on the class point, the clever enslaved man, Tranio, right? Outwitting this rich Senex. Right, so who's really like intel? And this is a this is there's some like buried anxieties in here about Greek slaves who are way more intelligent than Roman, you know, um, like patricians or rich people in general. There's plenty of rich plebeians at this time as well. Um, it's this idea that the Greek enslaved people 
they are really, I mean, they're the ones who are educated and they're the ones who are educating the children, right? These are the ones who actually are intelligent. It has that class commentary. It breaks down this myth of enslaved people's inferiority a little bit, though I don't think that's actually, I'm not sure that Plautus is really, he's not advocating for like emancipation or anything, but it's an important point from the class perspective. And then finally, we have a comedic ending. Everything works out in the end. Of course, that's because it's comedy, but also it's because of the privilege of the characters. I mean, I think that's really important to, to, to note. Like, if you're not rich, this stuff doesn't really work out for you. It works out because they're wealthy and because they're well off. That's why we get the ending we do in Mostelaria. Um, and that's really important to think about as well. So once again, heavily male-centered story. You know, little female perspective at all, of course. Um, some commentary about enslaved people and their cleverness and intelligence vis-a-vis -vis the ruling classes. And then, of course, privilege. All at work in Mostelaria. Really interesting play. Um, let's finish up our discussion of the Plautine source material, though, with Cassina. Cassina is um, interesting because the play is actually named after a female character, right? Cassina is a young enslaved woman. There's two guys um, who are really interested in her. Uh, Euthynicus is the first. He's a young man, pretty rich. Um, his father, Lysidamus, um, is the other, right? Now, I know, right? We have father and son, uh, both lusting after an enslaved woman. This doesn't look good for our, I mean, did we expect it to look good? We sort of knew going in, I think, on some level that Plautus is not great on gender issues. Um, but nevertheless, some creepy, creepy things going on in this play. Um, Cleostrata, who's the wife of Lysidamus, uh, the mother of Euthynicus, humiliates her husband in this really fascinating way, um, has her uh, slave, Kalinus, dress as Cassina and pretend to solicit her husband in a sexual way. Um, there is a really explicit scene um, which involves commentary on genitalia and all sorts of things. Um, it is really fascinating. Uh, if you ever, like if you get to college, very much do not read this now, you're, you're still young. <laughs> but when you get to college, if you're interested in gender studies, women and gender studies, if you're interested in English, if you're interested in classics, if you're interested in, in theater and drama, um, read that scene, study that scene. Um, that's really important. I think it's under discussed. Really interesting um, commentary on gender there. And then finally, in the end, Euthynicus actually comes back. So he's forced away by his father. His father like manages to get him out of the city. Um, he returns. Cassina is actually found, based upon what we talked about before. Wait a minute, she's actually a free woman who's super wealthy. And then they get to marry and everything is okay. Social problem of like a rich guy marrying a poor woman is avoided. Um, so that's Cassina. Let's take a look more in depth and let's get into gender for a second. So gender and Cassina here, the jealous wife, once again, right, we have this adultery plot. Now, instead of a meritrix, um, we have an enslaved woman instead, right? But still, that same thing as was work, uh, was at work in Nike Me is again at work in Cassina. Also, we got the creepy dad, um, which is the thing as well in Cassina. So important, important to point out. Kalinus is cross-dressing, right? Um, there is somewhere within this scene as I said, there is an argument. There's a, something that happens in the scene. Again, I'm really dancing around the particulars. Um, on you know, when when you get to when you get to the age in which that is appropriate, I, you know, delve into it by all means. Um, but but discretion, please, uh, of course. Um, anyway, Collins is cross-dressing. Um, I think there's something in this that implicitly acknowledges that gender is fluid, right? Gender can change. Expression can change at the very least. We don't get a sense that identity can change here. And we don't have gender identity really changing in this scene, but we do have gender expression changing. And we have the perception of Kalinus changes, right? Um, Lizadamus and Olympio, the two characters who encounter him as he's dressed as Cassina, read him as a woman, right? Like, um, and I use he, him pronouns here uh, because that's what um, he goes back to, and the indication is that he is, um, that is his identity, though we don't, we don't know. Um, but there is, a, there is a sense that gender is social role play, right? It's just putting on, there's something, you know, 
fundamental. Now, gender identity is not social, social role play, but gender expression is 100% social role play. And it is in Casina, right? We see Kali News get to adopt an expression and play the role of a woman. And that sort of breaks down some of this biological essentialism that unfortunately we're still living with, but was very much, of course, in the discourse in Roman times as well. Um, and so that's really important. Uh, gender roles are also fluid, right? Cassina herself um, not only changes roles uh, from enslaved woman to free woman, but also changes her sort of like position in society, the way she walks through the world as a woman changes. She goes from um, obviously from slave to free, but also from married, you know, from unmarried to married, from an object of desire to an upstanding uh, virtuous woman, a weirdo in her own right. Um, and that's really interesting. So we get the sense in Cassina, I think this is one of the most interesting Plautus plays from, a, from the perspective of gender studies um, and from the perspective of just drama studies overall, right? I think Cassina undertaught, under talked about in so many ways, but I wanted to bring it up here. Really a fascinating play um, from, from a gender perspective. Class as well, right? Plautine tropes once again at work here. The seemingly enslaved woman is actually a free woman at the end of the play, right? The father and son are both rather weirdly attracted to Cassina regardless of her class, right? For the father, for Lysidamus, it's adulterous, right? It's, uh, it's, it's read as the sort of like middle-aged man's lust. Um, for Euthynicus, for his son, it is class-defying love, right? It is the makings of a fairy tale. Um, you know, the rich boy loves the poor girl or the princess loves the poor man, right? This classic fairy tale storytelling is, is, is at work, right? In Casina as well. Um, and then we have this sense, um, which is kind of interesting, right? Because we talked about how gender is kind of fluid or at least gender expression is kind of fluid in Casina. But there is a sense that class is somehow not fluid at all. That there's like, there is an essentialism in class. Um, there's this sense of inherent standing or inherent freebornness. It's as if Cassina, like she was always free. You just didn't know that she was free. Like it's, it's the same in the same way that one's gender identity is always there even if their expression or their assigned sex at birth doesn't show it, right? The exact same sense in class that Plautus is able to sort of like um, oddly right, put out here for us. And I don't like, I, I should be very clear. I don't think he is anywhere near our modern understanding of gender identity. That's not what I'm saying at all. I just think it's really interesting, right? We're able to get some gender fluidity in Cassina. And then we're able to get the sense that Cassina is inherently a freeborn person. She's an inherently a free woman, even if on the outside, she's a slave woman for a long time but there's something inherent about her class, which is why it's okay for her to be married to Euthynicus at the end, because not only because she's now freed, because she was born free, but she was born free and was somehow free throughout the whole thing. Like she's worthy of Euthynicus's desire throughout the whole thing on a class basis because of some inherent freebornness. And I just think that's a really interesting thing um, in this play as well. All right, let's take a deep breath. <laughs> We've just gone through so much of the Roman dramatic uh, tradition through a couple of key examples. I want to spend sort of like this, the last third or so of, of our time, maybe the last half of our time, depending on how long it actually takes, um, talking about theatrical descendants. We're going to spend some time on Shakespeare, and then we're going to move into American cinema. And like I said, we're going to get to all the boys I love before um, is coming, I promise, at the end. Um, don't worry, we're gonna get there. So let's start with Shakespeare though, because Shakespeare is the one who sort of, you, know, you talk about the Renaissance as a revival period of, of reviving the classics. As someone who also studies a lot of medieval literature, I will say like the Middle Ages deserve a lot more credit and there's so much there to talk about, uh, particularly from a gender perspective. I could I could <laughs> spend a whole other discamus on uh, old French romances and, and, and the gender dynamics. But again, um, I'm just revealing myself to be an absolute nerd here. I apologize, but, um, but no, nevertheless, um, Shakespeare is going to revive a lot of Plautus, even though some of it is still around in the Middle Ages, but he is going to study Plautus in school. And he is going to be, he's gonna study Latin. He's gonna be exposed to these plays directly. And that is new. So references to Plautus are not new. Plenty of medieval plays in some way are dealing with the classical dramatic tradition, even if like they're not 
really dealing with it because it's pagan, right? Um, and the church is not going to be okay with that. A lot of medieval drama is liturgical. It's church drama, right? So they're not going to be touching like the themes of Plautus. <laughs> it could be any, um, not going to be any prostitutes on stage in medieval drama, but you do have this sense that the tradition is being referenced. But by the time of Shakespeare, the change is that he's actually going to read Plautus for the first time that anyone has read Plautus since the Roman period, right? Since the reign of Augustus. And he is going to have a chance to engage with that tradition directly. We're going to spend most of our time on Much Ado About Nothing. I put the Comedy of Errors on this slide just to note that Menaikmi, um, you probably already know this, but Menaikmi becomes the Comedy of Errors, basically the same play. Shakespeare adds uh, a couple of elements. Um, you know, we're not going to talk a lot about it just because of time, but just wanted to note that. But let's go ahead and talk about Shakespeare and then get into Much Ado. So as I said, Shakespeare encounters Roman drama directly at the Stratford Grammar School at, in his hometown, as you, as you probably have <laughs> memorized at some point, of Stratford-upon-Avon in Warwickshire. Um, he is going to encounter these things as a student there. He's in school till maybe 13, maybe 15, maybe 16. We, we really don't know exactly. Nevertheless, classical illusions are all over the place in Renaissance drama, but Shakespeare is really interesting because he doesn't just like allude to the myths, which he does, like Midsummer Night's Dream, right? Or other plays are filled with that. He literally takes the stories and reimagines them and understands them differently. And he's engaging with the plots of Plautus, not just the themes and not just the Romanness of them, right? And that makes him unique. Um, one of the many things that makes him unique. Shakespeare's comic devices. What does he do? What are his themes? What is Shakespearean comedy? Well, again, I could spend another hour just on an introduction to Shakespearean comedy, but impersonation, big thing. Mistaken identity all the time, obviously comedy of errors. Also tons of cross-dressing in Shakespeare like Casina um, and in general loss of social conventions, right? These are the things that make Shakespearean comedy, Shakespearean comedy. Twelfth Night. It's a really good example of all three of these things, right? You have um, the impersonation of a man, right? So the cross-dressing and impersonation, you have mistaken identity. Um, you have the loss of the social conventions that, that should tell you that like um, Viola is supposed to be a woman, not a man, i.e. she's supposed to dress like a woman and that she doesn't, right? And that is a loss of social conventions. Um, you have that sense all of that is going on in Shakespearean comedy. And it really complicates our understanding of gender in the Renaissance. Like it's not, gender in the Renaissance is super fluid guys, um, particularly in the sense of expression. So obviously, like I said, this is actually like, the cross-dressing is an inherent part of the theater in the Renaissance because it's only male uh, actors, right? And so you have, you know, Viola is played by a man um, in both of the presentations, right? In uh, stereotypically female presentations, stereotypically male presentation. Um, anyway, moving forward, romance um, is a surprisingly female-centered thing in Shakespeare. Tons of just queens, like true queens in Shakespeare. I just love them so much. Um, we're going to talk about Beatrice, but I mean, Portia um, and Viola and, you know, all of these just amazing heroines in Shakespeare. I mean, they're just such great female characters. Um, unfortunately, Shakespeare's not always this good. Um, I should say Taming of the Shrew, absolute misogynistic disaster. Two Gentlemen of Verona, major problems. Um, and also the tragedies. Uh, like there's basically no lines for women at all in the tragedies and the histories, but in comedy, Shakespeare does actually include like some decent um, female characters. And that's really important. And that the simultaneous borrowing and subversion of Plautus' style of his romantic dynamics. So Shakespeare's going to borrow some things. He's also going to complicate some things. He's going to add the female-centered stories, which complicate Plautus' only male-centered stories. He's going to add these things in and make things very complicated. Um, where Plautus, you know, kept things pretty formulaic, male-centered storytelling, um, you know, romance plot that involve uh, social strain, enslaved people, objectification of women, right? All these things, this is Plautus, right? Always Plautus, 20 plays, you're gonna find some combination of that in Plautus. Shakespeare's more complicated, right? He's going to muddy the waters a little bit on that. And then finally, I steal this from uh, Catherine, Catherine Moss, um, who is 
one of the editors of the Norton Shakespeare Anthology and also a professor at the University of Virginia. Um, once again, wahoo wah. Um, she talks about how, you know, comedy is about the construction of community. Um, and this is why like gender and class are so important in comedy and it's why we're focusing on comedy instead of like Seneca and tragedy is because you know, this is what Shakespearean comedy in particular and comedy in general is about. It's about how do communities get created? Who's included? Who's not included? What is it to be a man? What is it to be a woman? Is there such a thing as really being a man or a woman? Um, what is it to live in society in a gendered sense, in a class sense? All of these things, right, are just like, that's comedy, right? That is Shakespearean comedy. And that is why he's so important to the tradition. All of this comes to a head in Much Ado About Nothing. I choose Much Ado for two reasons. One, because it's the most innovative of Shakespeare's comedies. Um, I mean, that can be argued. I'm sure there's gonna be someone at the discussion who's like, you said Much Ado About Nothing was the most innovative, but in fact, measure for measure, it's gonna happen. It's okay. <laughs> I'd be happy to discuss it more, but Much Ado About Nothing, apologies for the shaking of the table there, Much Ado About Nothing, my favorite play. Um, so my bias is showing a little bit here. Um, but it's really important from a gender and class perspective. And I'm, I'm about to explain why, obviously, uh, but it's, it's, it's a very important play, um, I think, at least. A bunch of guys return from war to Sicily, the city of Messina in Sicily, right? Claudio, young guy, very uh, distinguished in war. Florentine, he's from Florence. He falls in love with the heiress hero. First sight, oh my God, that's her, right? This is what happens to Claudio. Claudio has a best friend. His best friend's name is Benedict. Benedict is also really distinguished in war. Benedict had a previous relationship of some kind, we don't really know what, with a woman named Beatrice, who is the um, cousin, who is the cousin of Hero, almost forgot, the cousin of Hero. And those two, while Claudio and Hero are swooning over each other, those two are fighting one another. Um, Leonato, one of the characters, the father of Hero, calls this a merry war uh, betwixt Signor Benedict and her. Um, truly a brilliant, I mean, I could quote much ado at you all day. Um, Savvy knows this very well. Um, shout out to Savvy, BJCL president. Thank you for putting on such a great convention. Um, I have quoted much ado to her very often. She knows she knows this very well. Um, and to others, I'm sure, in BSCL and NSCL um, as well. But nonetheless, um, this you know, relationship is, is really interesting. They're fighting this sparring in words, but they're eventually tricked to thinking that they love, like the other one loves them, right? So. Benedict is tricked by Claudio and the prince Don Pedro and Leonato to believe that Beatrice is actually in love with him, right? And Beatrice is tricked by Hero and her gentlewoman Ursula to convince her that Benedict is actually in love. And once they know that the other person is in love, they're like, I'm in love now, right? You know, Beatrice says, you contempt, farewell, and maiden pride adieu. No glory lives behind the back of such, right? Like, she gives, she gives up that maiden pride when she learns that Benedict is in love. And Benedict says the same thing. Um, you know, love me, why it must be requited, right? Like this is, you know, it's, I'm sorry, my, my, um, my fangirling is showing here. <laughs> but nonetheless, um, the evil Don John, uh, brother, illegitimate brother of the Prince Don Pedro, He's able to convince Claudio that Hero is actually like unchaste, that, he, that she's um, sleeping with uh, this other like random guy and their marriage basically gets called off on the altar. Claudio is like, you're, uh, you know, um, he literally calls her like a spoiled or like a rotten fruit, um, which is obviously very stark image and is something that is unfortunately very common in Renaissance drama. And then Hero, uh, basically fakes her death. Claudio is like, like, oh no, right? Like she's dead and then finds out that he was actually tricked. He's obviously broken up, um, goes to her, her tomb, quote unquote, and hangs an epitaph and promises to marry um, Leonato's niece, sight unseen. Um, however, the niece is actually hero and everyone gets back together and then Benedict and Beatrice um, also unite as well. So, I know that was a lot. This is a shot from the 1993 um, film version of Much Ado, which you absolutely like, must watch. Um, as you can see, Kenneth Brenna, 
Sir Kenneth Branagh, director of the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, my, my you know, one of the great Shakespeare cinematic savants, and then Emma Thompson, who at the time was married to him. Um, you see Denzel Washington here and, and Keanu Reeves as well. It's a great film uh, version of, of the play, really well done and really well adapted. Um, so what do we see from Plautus here, right? Claudio and Hero's romance is classic Plautus. Um, we got concerns about chastity. We got concerns about propriety. Um, is she chaste? Is she not? Is she a weirdo, right? That's the big thing. Um, Claudio is also kind of like a classic macho, like he's, a, he's, you know, he's got the classic, you know, manliness going on as well. And Hero is the classically demure um, sort of, you know, young woman in, in these social roles. And so they both fit into this like high romance plot, which is very medieval and it's very Plautine as well. Um, like in Casina and Mostelaria, right? This is all deception in disguise, right? This, you know, there's the disguise of, there's literally a mask like a masquerade, um, which goes on, they're literally all wearing masks. And then also you have, you know, the, the disguise of, um, of Hero as the niece, right? Um, the trickery that goes on to get Benedict and Beatrice to fall in love. And then of course, this is a play about high class people doing high class things, right? I mean, that's what it is. This is a, an upper middle class, not even upper middle class, this is a rich person's play. Um, these are nobles, right? The prince, Don John, and warrior Benedict, and great Claudio, right? The noble Claudio, he's often called. And then similarly, right, the, the fair hero and, um, and Beatrice, who is herself, um, you know, rather well inherited. Um, so that's important to note, right? We're still in high class plays. Um, so what is Shakespeare doing to really kind of subvert the Plautian tradition? Obviously, Much Ado is very involved in Plautus and is related to that, uh, to his work. But Benedict and Beatrice are a big way in which Shakespeare's departing from the Plautine tradition here. Instead of like in Menaikmi, where we see the brother's relationship comes before the relationship between husband and wife, here we reverse that. Homosocial male relationship, that is a childish thing. That's a boyish thing. A man is devoted to one person and one woman in particular. That is Shakespeare. That is much ado. And so in Act 4, Scene 1, when Benedict, when Benedict says, you know, bid, me, bid me do anything for thee, right? To Beatrice, she says, kill Claudio, because Claudio has wronged her, her, um, her cousin, right? She's falsely accused her cousin of being unchaste. And Benedict is like, I, I, I can't, right? And, and she's like, well, then you're you're like not a real man, right? There's some suggestion that you're not you're not only not husband material, but you're not. That's not what men do, um, and that's really fascinating because you see that as a reversal from the Plautine tradition. Benedict finally says in one of the great lines of Much Ado, "Enough, I am engaged," right? Meaning engaged in the sense of engaged in the action of fighting Claudio, but also in some sense engaged in a marital sense. Um, Female-centered scenes and storylines, right? Tons of that in Much Ado. Hero and Ursula, Margaret, who's the woman um, who like plays Hero in the staged um, adultery scene. All of that, right, gives us a sense of real female characters. We get real, real female characters with real stories. Beatrice in particular, as I said, one of the great female lead characters in Shakespeare. She's witty, she stands toe to toe with Benedict. She's as intelligent as Benedict, as well educated. Just, I mean, an amazing character in so many ways. Um, and, you know, it's not enough to redeem Shakespeare's sins, of course, uh, in other places for his misogyny, um, but it's worth noting. Like Shakespeare, you know, for all of that, that misogyny in his plays is also has a lot of, you know, progressive moments as well. And I think those are worthy of noting as along with the misogynistic moments. Um, Beatrice is certainly a character who exemplifies that. And then finally, the concerns about female chastity and sexual propriety in sort of in the other direction, this is, you know, a, a bad thing in terms of gender, are way more of a big deal in this play than in Plautus. Like Plautus cares about the weirgo being kind of chased or whatever, but with the Christianization, with this sense, obviously with the plot, the whole thing is about like how Hero is chased, but like then accused of not being chased, like a whole thing, right? Chastity is just such a like such a big deal here. Whereas Claudio, like for sure, has had sex before. Like he's no virgin. Um, 
but nobody cares, right? It's, it's, you know, this is a standard put on women only and it continues to be in much ado. So drawing out from Shakespeare, what have we learned? How does Shakespeare hand the baton from Plautus to large and cubby, right? Like how, you know, what does he do? Um, he uses a Plautine vocabulary, right? Like these stories are told, Much Ado is kind of a Plautine comedy when it starts out. It kind of works on those lines, but then it subverts a lot of that, right? Because women's perspectives get included. There is no real like Senex authority figure. Leonato is like the Senex of this play. He's down with whatever, get married to her, no problem. Yes, Beatrice, please. Like he's so, he's helping out in the, in the deception of Benedict to try to get them together. He's a matchmaker in himself, right? So, you know, the, there's a lot of the, like, the casing is very Plautine, but then on the inside, there's all of these subverted expectations. We also have Shakespearean romance itself being Plautine on the outside, but then again, more complex, right? So some of Shakespeare's romances, um, or I should say romantic plots, right? Because the ro romance is also a term we use for some of Shakespeare's plays. Um, but Shakespeare's romantic plot, sometimes like in Two Gentlemen of Verona, one of his earliest plays, um, is a classic Plautine comedy, right? Valentine wants to marry Sylvia. Sylvia's father, the emperor, says no, right? That's not going to happen. And that's a classic Plautine comedy. But here in Much Ado, so Two Gentlemen is, is written in 1592, Much Ado is written in 1598. Here in Much Ado, Shakespeare's departing from that. He's learning new tricks and he is bringing them into action. So instead of the Senex, we get the obstacle is actually this chastity plot, this concern about um, faithfulness, right? And adultery. And then the Benedict and Beatrice thing, which is so more, so much more nuanced. And it's really a sense of two equals and two partners getting married instead of like this Claudio and Hero is, a, is, a, is an aristocratic marriage, right? Much like the Plautine marriages. But Benedict and Beatrice, that's a marriage for love in like the closest we can get to that in the Renaissance. And it's really fascinating. Again, though, we must say, Shakespeare's plays, other plays of this time, still upper class plays, right? We have not really seen, um, there's fewer, you know, there's no enslaved people in, in, um, in Much Ado. There are some servants, right, employed servants. Um, but even so, right, we still have this sense that this is an upper class story. All right. To all the boys I loved before, I promised we would get there and we are here. This is surprisingly like a part of the Roman comedic tradition, um, or not a part of it, but a descendant of the Roman comedic tradition. I'm going to show you why. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of the, the original and then the sequel. Again, very brief. I'm not going to summarize the plot too much because, you know, so many people, that's the thing, right? Like so many people have seen this film. It was one of the most watched films of 2018. Um, and Netflix doesn't even tell us the real statistics, so who knows, right? Um, we're just projecting that it is. I think there's this sense that, you know, like this isn't on the level of Plautus or Shakespeare in terms of art. And like, I'm not going to tell you that To All the Boys I Loved Before has the same, like, is as good as Much Ado About Nothing. It's not, right? Like, but that doesn't mean that To All the Boys I Loved Before is not worthy of study. Um, and I think we run into this trap a lot where people assume that because it's a romantic comedy, it's not worthy of, of thinking about where that's what we've been thinking about all day. And it's important. And let's talk about why. Um, let's look into it. So Lara Jean, right? Her middle school love letters get sent out to five boys that she loved in middle school, right? Um, hence the title. And then she has to navigate the aftermath of that. Um, she writes a contract with Peter, obviously, to like fake date him. Um, but ultimately the two develop feelings for each other. They get together in the end. Um, there's a lot I'm skipping over, but I'm assuming that people are like familiar with it. And then in the sequel, P.S. I Love You, um, Laura Jean's feelings um, get torn between Peter and then this well-mannered, um, just like very goals guy <laughs> named John Ambrose, um, which you all probably know as well. So let's get into this. Um, what do we get from Roman drama in To All the Boys I Loved Before? Well, we're back. Deception in disguise. Once again, uh, Mostelaria to Much Ado, we get this, and it is the central ingredient here. Fake dating, which is in itself a form of deception. Um, we have this, you know, the sense of um, 
if not disguise, right, then, then certainly there is, um, there's so much performance that goes on in this film, right? You have, you know, Peter, who is like with Jen and not with Jen all the time. Like that's, you know, such a huge part of this um, and his dueling attractions, uh, his dueling feelings. And there is a sense that, you know, is Peter ever like real, you know, in these films? That is in and of itself a kind of disguise. Um, we have obviously heavily gendered contexts and homosociality once again, right? Peter's Peter and the boys, the lacrosse team, and then, um, you know, Lara Jean and her sisters, right? And that strong female bond. And, and you know, we, we have that again. The fundamental, this sort of uh, third point here is just a fundamental inheritance from platine comedy in general, which is we have feelings followed by the obstacle, followed by the romance at the end, right? This is classic rom-com plot and it is classic Plautus, right? Feelings from the, the Adulescens to the Weirgo, right? Or to the various like young woman. There's an obstacle of some kind. His dad comes back. Um, he's like fighting over the girl with his dad. Um, there's like mistaken identity, whatever. There's an obstacle, it gets resolved. Same thing into All the Boys I Loved Before, right? It's the same tradition. It's coming down from that same tree, right? We have feelings, which develop sort of in this way between Peter and Lara Jean. There's an obstacle, right, in the first film, then they get together, then we continue. There's another obstacle, right, with these like sort of Peter helping Jen out with her, um, you know, like parents' divorce, but then also that being read by Lara Jean as um, him having residual feelings and then John Ambrose being such a king, right, and that's like adds to this whole thing of there's an obstacle, but in the end, romance, right? This classical cycle is something that is at play into All the Boys I Loved Before. I'm not sure, you know, like you don't necessarily notice that, but it's there. Like Plautus is in this film in a major way. Um, again, this is still an upper middle class story for the most part. You know, you know Mr. Mr. Covey is a, is a doctor, right? Like it's well off, you know, these kids are well off mostly. Important to know. And then finally, how does To All the Boys I've Loved Before subvert and innovate on the Roman model? The funny, I mean, like, it, it's not even funny. It's just so profound, actually. The To All the Boys I've Loved Before reverses the Weirgo Meritrix thing, I think, this is what I would contend, between John Ambrose and Peter, right? So John, all of a sudden we have men fighting this expectation that was the classical Plautine dispute between the Weirgo and the Meretric, between the Uxor and Erotium, right? Uh, between Cassina and um, Lysidamus' wife, like all of that, right? That's John Ambrose versus Peter, right? John Ambrose is virtuous. He is, um, you know, well-mannered. He's decorous. He's the one who'll treat you well, right? Peter, is kind of a bad boy in some way. You know, he's kind of mysterious. He's not as emotional. He copies poems from Edgar Allan Poe. I mean, seriously, come on, right? Like that, that dynamic. Now, I wanna be crystal clear. It does not have nearly the damage, you know, or like the negative connotations that Weirgo Meritrix does. That has huge misogynistic undertones. That is not the case between John Ambrose and Peter, but it's really interesting how when you tell the story from the woman's perspective, you suddenly like have less misogyny, right? Like, I wonder why, right? But when you tell the story from Lara Jean's perspective, you get this dichotomy and it's really fascinating. That point, once again, this is a woman authored story. It's a women led story, very important. And then something that doesn't really happen in Plautus and like very little in Shakespeare is the plot development of the family of Lara Jean, the family of the main character. We get a lot more than romance into all the boys I've loved before. And that's important because Roman plays not organizing around that. So it's, it's mostly about the romance or like the, the tricks of the wily enslaved person or whatever. That's Roman comedy. Here, we care about Lara Jean's sister. We care about our, both of her sisters. We care about Josh. We care about so many other people. Um, and that's really important as well in terms of just complicating the Roman model. All right. It's been an adventure, guys. Let's sum it all up and then I will send you on your way. Um, what do we learn, right? Plautine romance is around in American culture today, right? It's elemental, it's very like in its fundamental sense of feelings, obstacle, romance, right? In its fundamental sense of highly gendered situations, homosocial situations, that is in our vocabulary, 
these stories are with us. To all the boys I've loved before is one example of many. Clueless is one example of many of these stories. Now, obviously, we have the Shakespearean innovations that are also with us, right? He took Plautus and updated a lot of that for us to understand. So, you know, so to all the boys I've loved before, Clueless, these are descendants of Much Ado and plays like that as much as they are of Plautus, right? But it's, it's a tree, right? This is a, you know, it's, it's a whole family tree of drama and cinema that comes down from really Menander, but then Plautus. And then, you know, it's important to recognize in the end, as we so, talk so much about gender and class stereotypes and how gender and class are portrayed, our storytelling, you know, it lives with this, right? We have this misogynistic and classist substrate in our storytelling. There's also a racist substrate in our storytelling, all of these other things, right? Those are there because that's the way that stories were told. And, you know, to all the boys I've loved before and Clueless and films and even Much Ado, right? And things like that, they complicate, they make things less problematic in some ways, but that story and Plautus's misogyny is here because he is here. He's a part of us um, and his storytelling is with us. And I think that's important. So as we close things out, here is a shot of um, the Elizabeth Bowman Theater at the Oregon Shakespeare Festival in Ashland, Oregon, um, the largest Shakespeare Festival, largest Elizabethan theater in the world. Um, I just want to close things out by saying, first of all, thank you for being, uh, you know, so attentive and caring about all this content. I know we worked through a lot today, but I hope it was informative. Please come out to the discussion slash q and I don't know what time that's going to be at yet. Um, consult the schedule, please. I would love to have deeper conversations about any and all of this, um, whether it's, you know, would you choose Peter or John Ambrose or, a, you know, like a, a nuanced discussion of, um, you know, of how Plautus is really alive and well in our, in our time. Um, just remember this as you go forward, even if you don't come to discussion, I will be very disappointed, but that's fine. Um, so much else to do, so many other great speakers, but please carry forward with you this understanding that, you know, Roman drama is with us, right? Plautus is here. Um, these stories live on and they live on in you. Like our media does, these things, you know, to this day. And these stories are with us and they're within us. So just, just remember that. Think about how gender is being portrayed for you. Think about how class is being portrayed for you. Always strive to complicate um, and go out there and, and enjoy all of this media because it is valuable. Um, but consider it well and consider it uh, in a nuanced way. Thank you guys so much. I'm so, so grateful for you being here. Have a great convention. I hope to see you live and synchronously on Zoom on November the 21st to the 22nd. Until then, have a great day. Gratias, Wobis, Aga. <laughs>